Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. I am Donald Tutera, UK arts journalist, etc. And I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Taiwan Season Online Symposium 2020. Now, for those of you who have been here before, you sort of know that I'm going to do the pitch now about what is Taiwan Season Online Symposium. Well, every Tuesday, there is an informal discussion between me and one of the four choreographers whose work was meant to be seen live all month in Edinburgh. Uh, it's uh, repeated on Thursdays uh, and also uh, all of these uh, sessions, including the webinars, are going to be part of the archive that is accessible on Cultural Taiwan UK YouTube and Taiwan Seasons YouTube as well. And then on Wednesdays and Fridays, we have the webinars. Um, each week it is themed, uh, so that's in two parts. Each part is different, um, and it is with experts in artistic practice, production, programming, and presentation from Taiwan and abroad. Uh, we welcome your questions uh, at any point. Uh, we'll see them filtered in comment boxes because we want, we want to know who you are, where you are, and what you want to know and what you can bring to the virtual table today. I'm very excited, not only because I'm in a new location for me as the host of this uh, symposium, I'm in my attic room, um, but I'm also very excited because today we are looking at cross-cultural translation and collaboration in the performing arts within the context of live art. So uh, again, uh, do uh, bring questions to us. Uh, the way this is going to work, uh, River Lynn, our keynote speaker, will be out here with me shortly on the virtual stage. Uh, he's going to show some video expert, uh, experts, excerpts and uh, do a PowerPoint presentation. And he has three lovely, lively guests. Uh, and after uh, that, after maybe about an hour, because this is a two hour session, um, we, we will all be in the room together and um, be talking and filtering in your input, your questions. So River, please join me now. Hi, everybody. Hello, Donna. <laughs> Thank you for your... Ni hao. Ni hao. <laughs> uh, Bonsoir à tous uh, and Wang An and good afternoon, morning, evening, whatever, everybody from around the world. Um, so, yeah, uh, today I'm very pleased to be able to present, um, conceive and present this um, webinar entitled uh, Cross-Cultural Translation and Collaboration in the Performing Arts in the Context of the Taiwan-UK Connection. And so as uh, what briefly um, Donna has mentioned, uh, this section uh, I will be um, presenting um, some case studies from Taiwan in collaboration with international artists in terms of the cross-culture projects. Uh, but at the same time, I will be having um, three guests, they are um, artists, um, Wu Kang Chen, Cheng Wu Kang, a dancer and choreographer from Taiwan, and Yo Yo Gong, um, producer, curator, and founding member of uh, Prototype Paradise, uh, and theater, participatory theater collective from Taiwan. Also, my very special guest tonight, today, will be Faith Tong, originally um, working in um, Espanay Theater on the Bay as head of um, theater and dance, currently working as the head of programming of the dance house in Helsinki. Um, so I guess uh, today, since we have lovely um, special guests, so uh, I would really love to have um, their opinions at the same time, get to know their creative and creative curatorial process in terms of addressing this subject. And today I have two case studies to be sharing with you. So shall we start? Okay, cool. See now, you later. See you later, Donna, thank you. Um, now I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself a little bit. 
So uh, I'm River Lane. I'm from Taiwan, based in Paris as a performance artist and independent curator. And that's all. <laughs> OK, can I share my screen? Does that work? OK. So um, the image of the first page of my PowerPoint is the performance project Night Market Theater. Um, I will be introduced. I will be introducing this project later. So today we're gonna talk about translation and collaboration in this cross cultural context. Let's go. Um, when I was invited by the um, Taiwan Cultural Ministry Office in the UK to conceive and host this webinar and discussion, some critical notions and questions came to me such as what does it mean to cross you know cross as a verb like no matter crossing border or crossing um things or crossing differences and at the same time how does crossing as the verb suggest in the artistic context um in well when when in taiwan it's very specific when taiwanese in this industrial sphere of the arts, visual arts and performing arts, cross-cultural collaboration has become uh, recently a very fashionable term. And the reason why it has become fashionable, not only related to the artistic desire of this practice, but also related to Taiwan's very special um, or difficult or challenging positions in terms of the foreign affair, also, that's also why that um, in the institutional sphere, programmers, curators, or even the Taiwanese government have been increasingly encouraging artists to go abroad, either doing residency or finding some opportunities, also to work with um, other artists from outside Taiwan. And that has become, of course, artistic strategy of working together, but at the same time, it has been also presenting or representing the ongoing phenomenon and perhaps um, diplomatic problem of how the performing arts or the contemporary performing arts in Taiwan can be connected and to be seen by the world. So this subject will be starting from Taiwan. At the same time, I hope this um, discussion can be expanded um, within the Asia Pacific region in terms of its politics of performativity or the contemporary art. And then, and then through this um, complexity, through examining the complexity between the artists and institutions point of view that hope in this two hour webinar session, we can dive in some deeper discussion. So the second notion and question is about when two ends or many ends parts of the artists or institutions come together to collaborate with one another. How to translate or how the translation of language, body, paradigm, identity, differences, embodiment, and also reenactment can work or not. And through this, um, through today's two case studies, we hope to dive in deeper as well to inviting like artists and producers from their point of view and also their creative process to be introducing how did they make it, what didn't work and what did work and how they will look back their creative process after some years to reconsider those um, cultural politics within these dimensions. And the third question and notion is, very industrial. Um, how does the cross culture production present or represent for what and from the institutional's point of view and individual independent um, artistic point of view, how this cross culture projects, productions, or let's say commercially product has been considered in the cultural strategy in relation to tourism or when 
artists are touring cross culture um, projects and performances in a world when they are confronting the audiences or um, other presenters' point of view in this um, sphere, how the understanding can be formulated within the conversation and through presenting the work. Right. I know it sounds might be very big. Yes. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to show you the very uh, short two excerpts of these two projects that we will be examining and having the um, key person of the project to share their point of views. The first one, uh, as the cover has already revealed, is Night Market Theatre. This is a project conceived and staged by the British artist Joshua Safair in collaboration with Prototype Paradise with a bunch of Taiwanese stage designer, performers, and production team. Um, so as the image suggests, this is part of the performances. And as you can see, this, um, this gentleman um, is wearing something like from the Qing Dynasty or ancient China, Chinese culture with the crown. And his character in this performance is Emperor. So this very short bite size performance in the Night Market Theater is called The Arrival of Empero. So when the audience order this performance to the store of the Night Market Theater, they will receive this performance. And as the image suggests, you will see you see like all the performance or even audience members are worshiping him. And this, this really, this was, re this is really interesting, hilarious and entertaining in a way in the everyday context. So basically in this night market theater project, the artist Joshua Sofair with a bunch of Taiwanese crew and artists staging a real little booth in a real night market in Hualien, a city located in the East Taiwan. So um, this is very interesting because I don't know how many of the online viewers have been or have known the social, cultural, and context of Nine Market. Um, maybe I can quickly explain. Um, Nine Market is, you know, it's different from farmer's market or simply food market or food street market. It's particularly in the Asia Pacific region, or let's say in general in Asia, that during the night, they, the night market only open during the night. And they run their food, basically food business until late. And people strolling, people will be strolling around in night market, not only for searching food. Of course, food is very important. It's very critical in this context. But at the same time, people also do gathering. They hang out with friends, they hang out with family members to have dinner, to have drinks, to chat, to have like out of office, um, lovely time uh, in this open air setting of night market. So uh, what you see in this image that behind the performance, the performer and the audience member, you will see a black curtain, and that is actually the store itself. Um, so this project is basically transforming, um, well, and uh, transforming the idea of selling performance in relation to con culinary art to stage this real booth to serve performance as bite-sized food to the audience. Because uh, in in the everyday life, the night market is full of many little mobile stores. And basically all the stores or booths has the frame and it has become a symbol or an image of suggesting a theater framework. Let's look at uh, a piece of news uh, coverage of this night market theater. Taiwan 
。原来价目标不是卖吃，而是再卖艺。你无法预料的大考司。才开张已经围满观众，这时第一位客人上门，点的是一百块的皇上驾到。皇上，这您的帽子。皇上驾到。就眼前正照，年轻女孩也傻了。我是皇上，一百块，是的。接着又来两位男同学，快了，旋风马啊！舞台前连上两根马桶吸把，充当遥控器。<笑>原来这样的构思都是来自这位英国艺术家。They try to ask people to rethink what they might otherwise take for granted. I suppose that's the the kind of general overall meaning of night market. 爱上台湾夜市，因此结合八位本土艺术家花莲摆摊。如今夜市能吃喝，也能看表演，确实什么都卖，什么都不奇怪。Yes. That was the very short clip of、uh, Night Market Theater. I hope it has given you already very interesting and fascinating idea of how this project runs. And uh, the next um, case from Taiwan that I'm going to share is Behalf. Behalf.、Um, this project is a collaborative one between、uh, Chen Wukang and Kishi Klongjun from Thailand. And、uh, Wu Kang is a、um, modern or contemporary dancer and choreographer,、um, beginning his dancing career when he was young. Looted, perhaps if I'm wrong, maybe he can correct me later. That looted from the training of ballet and all the academic、um, system of how a dancer in Taiwan or generally in Asia would learn all the skills and technique to be a dancer. Mostly、um, in a Western、uh, um, methodology.、Um, however, Pichet Klongtun, he is a、um, practitioner dancer of Thailand classical mask dance called Kong dance. Kong is spelling as K H O N, and in this、um, classical mask dance,、uh, it has different roles. And perhaps in the con the context of this traditional dance of Thailand,、uh, maybe Wu Kang would introduce to us later.、Uh, in this project, we have basically based on the two choreographer has developing this project more than one year, that between one year and two years, from the first time they met, and then they started to travel to each other's places to Taiwan and to. To Thailand to have further exchange culturally, artistically, socially, politically.、Um, at the same time, they have become very good friends as well. And in this process of developing this project, they have been focusing on the loot or let's say the tradition of bodies. So it has been very interesting when they explore.、Um, Who owns the tradition, or that's the tradition? How the tradition, socially, politically, and historically, has been constructed and being understood in the contemporary society and art context. So, in this project, they eventually came out、um, a dance piece. However, not only dancing, but they also having some. Methods of lecture performance or post discussion to be part of the performance, and the excerpt I'm going to show you is not including the 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 talking part, more like the parts of、uh, movements and choreographic、uh, moments. Let's check it out. Your name is Pichet Blanchard. Your name is Pichet Blanchard. 
พิเชษกลัดชื่อนิสยูเนมพิเชษกลัดชื่อนิสยูเนมยูเนมพิเชษกลัดชื่อพิเชษกลัดชื่อนิสยูเนมYeah, so that was uh, the short clip of he had the work, and um, now we, I'd like to invite um, three our uh, our guest tonight and also Donna back to the stage. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, so um, before we uh, before we open the Q and A session and the discussion with the online audience members, I would like to have a little bit um, discussion um, based on these two projects. So um, at the very beginning, can I invite um, Wu Kuang and Yo Yo um, sharing the basic uh, creative process of each project that, for example, how did this idea come out or how did this opportunity arrive? And then how did you, uh, in collaboration with another artist to formulate this, this project? You come? Oh, me? Or, or you know? <laughs> uh, is it, who goes first? Oh, I go okay, okay. okay. <laughs> okay, okay. It's been a few years, so I don't quite remember how we started. Um, yeah, uh, in 2015, at the end of 2015, Piche was invited by the Ministry of Culture Taiwan to, to give a lecture about how traditional performers can, how to move traditional performers to today. And I didn't go to that lecture, but somehow one of my friends brings, took him to my studio. For a visit, and we had some conversation. When he arrives, I just saw a, a very calm figure and uh, so tradition, so like everything about him is so authentic that uh, makes me think a lot about my own identity. So during that visit, we he shared with me about meditation and fatherhood. And uh, oh. so after he left, I Facebook him. I add him as a friend, and he accepted. Then I asked him if he he would like to start a project with me, and because I want to ask and ask questions, maybe that would solve some of my question. So, and question was answered. 
after two years of process, in the beginning, we just share our lives. So we don't spend much time in the studio. We just tell each other story and visit with travel with families and show him Taiwan. And when I visit Bangkok, he took me, show me around. That's how we started it. Then I found out all the all the question I have about my identity that they don't have. So I was only bothering myself. So none of those questions really exist. Yeah, that was the answer. But during the process, we, we start to include because we bring in Fuquen, then Fuquen in the, in the, yeah, after the first rehearsal. And that very quickly, he helped us to assemble a really nice troupe. So we have lighting designer from Japan, Kinsei, and uh, our, so he and our producer just to make sure the troupe is right and tell uh, uh, suggest us where to go to uh, for the residency and make make sure that we can concentrate on finalizing the work and the language and um, yeah we learn we, we 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 not only the work that we we are very satisfied um the audience reaction we are also very satisfied yeah. And when you hang out together and gradually um, wanted to work with one another, what was the cr critical point that both of you wanted to address the idea oh. of um, the protocol of tradition of bodies? <laughs> uh, I think it's the money. Money is the... <laughs> Well, somebody shows their interest that gives us some confidence to pay it forward, to continue with the work. And the more we try and the more we rehearse, and more people start to get interested. So, yeah. Money! Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, this is a very interesting, yeah, because it's like, uh, reminding all of us like how we perceive this cross culture collaboration under this you know strategical policy of the government or funding bodies, right? I think mm -hmm. because I think we I'm not sure if I can see it that uh, so strategic like through strategy. We just we I'm just interested in working with him, but only the outsider can see or can see the strategy. Mm -hmm. or chemistry be between us. So mm -hmm. it has to be the third party that gives us the stimulation mm -hmm. or the first bucket. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And what about Yo-Yo? Mm. Hi. Um so our experience can be traced back to 2009. And that was the year when I first time attended uh, Joshua Sofair's works by myself. And at that time, I went to a festival in uh, called Wunderbar in, what was the city? Anyway, in, in UK and he's, uh, work in that festival was called Tours of People's Homes. So he uh, invited local residents to work with him and uh, program 11, 11 different uh, performances happening in their own homes. So I went to a, I went to one home and attend one of the, the performance and I like it very much. And at that time, um, my friend Jia Yuanqing, who is the co-producer with me on Night Market Theater, uh, we have some common friend with Joshua. So by uh, through that common friend, we started 
correspondent with Joshua asking him about some ideas behind the thing. And so we stay in contact. So then later on when we wanted to invite some artists to come to Taiwan to uh, to lead some kind of workshop which can enable the local artists to, to think um, in a different way about the relationship of audience, then we thought of Joshua. So we invited Joshua to come to Taiwan in 2012 to give a workshop of four days uh, with the theme of working with audience. So uh, during that trip, he, he was like working for one week and then he had another week, uh, did some kind of backpacking of his own all around Taiwan. So he went through several different night markets in Taiwan. And so on the night before he departed from Taiwan back to UK, so we had a dinner together and then we asked Joshua, so something like, um, so now you know Taiwan quite, not quite well, but known, now you know Taiwan a bit. So what would be in your mind if we one day, if one day we invited you to come to Taiwan to do a real production? Then he say, yes, there's something in my mind that I would very much like to try. And that is to work in a night market, to work alongside all those vendors in the night markets. And we liked the, the idea very much. I mean, uh, Yuan, my friend, co the co-producer friend and I, we liked that idea very much. So we started uh, further discussion with him by email back and forth. And here in Taiwan, we also started writing proposals, seeking funding and talking with friends. So eventually we managed <laughs> to bring him to Taiwan in 2004 to, uh, work in that east city of Taiwan, the city to the coast where there were many tourists. So he worked there with us and the other eight Taiwanese performers for one month. So it's, it was like three months um, ahead of the performance week. So the three weeks of devising process and rehearsals and the last week we brought our performances into the night markets and sold those performances to all the night market visitors there. Mm. Mm. So it actually took some time um, before really collaborating for a certain project, right? right? Like we get the time first and then um, followed by the back and forth of the, the, the post communication. And uh, I actually wonder that when you said, um, when, when Joshua proposed, he wanted to work within and with the context of my market. And you and your colleagues found it was really nice. Could you explain a little bit more why it was nice to you? Okay, because, um, yeah, sure. Because that really matches our agenda of establishing this performance company, Prototype Paradise. We, uh, the, the reason why we want to build up a new company on our own is that we want to try something outside of the uh, the, the customary theater realm. We really want to try to engage the general public uh, with our own art practice. Mm -hmm. And the best way to work with people of non-art background is perhaps just go outside of the theater space and go into the everyday life space. So um, yeah, before, before Night Market Theater, we, we hosted uh, two different workshops and also another performance uh, by uh, Gustavo Chiriaco. He was a Brazilian artist and that performance also happened on the streets. So we, we really want to try to uh, navigate how performance can interact with the general public that's just out there. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah, thank you, Yoyo. Um, I think, I think uh, behind the scene, I mean, the, per perhaps my very personal um, desire of having this Few different cases in conversation is really about um, how each project 
in Taiwan really marked something. Like for example, um, Yo-Yo's work with Joshua Sopel, the, the Night Market Theater, when they presented the Night Market Theater, at that time, that was the very, very beginning of the emerging notion of participatory art, art and socially engaged performance slash art in Taiwan. So in 2014, that work has gained a lot of attention, not only because it's interesting and social and everyday, in, like relaxing in the everyday context, but also how a bunch of theater makers, they, 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 you know, they leave the theater box behind and started to explore the notion of social engagement. And at that time, the social, the word, the wording social engagement has just slightly or slowly straddling the visual art and the performing art context. So that was really, um, um, I would say, a very iconic project. And as for Wukang and Pichet's um, collaboration, that was also um, lately in over the recent years, I would say um, one of a uh, very successful collaboration. And not only the show was successful, the very, um, very different point of view is they have been keeping collaborate with one another. So after BHAT, they sort of, um, you know, review the legacy or the findings of their research, and now they continue to push things or challenging themselves further in other contexts. So now they are still working together for next project. Well, I think Rama's house was yeah. the project, but because of the pandemic, so it didn't be presented. So hopefully next year. Yeah. Yes. And um, so at this moment, I would like to um, invite Faith. Um, uh, according to your um, working background and you know, you know, as a programmer, curator, also as an audience member, how did you, how do you see these two cases for you? Oh, you are muted, darling. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, River. I think these two case uh, studies are super interesting um, because it's it's a very interesting look into um, how contemporary artists are now thinking about collaboration and collaboration between um, artists from different uh, cultures. And what I, I saw was that there is a moving away from a very pure or clear sense of distinction and roles within uh, culture and within performance in terms of it being a representation of a form or a tradition um, or that it needs to be some kind of adaptation serving one particular overarching direction uh, or supporting a narrative. But instead, it's a, an approach that has a more independent position and um, reveal it, it is very revealing of a process instead of a process in itself of understanding and very much about relations relations um, to each other who who are involved in the performance and as you pointed out River um, to the audience and the audience plays such an important role as being an active member of uh, agency in in the in both works actually um, and and able to then uh, be on e almost equal terms in some way or even sometimes playing with the idea of of power that the audience uh, can be very much uh, a, a power position and not someone who is just quietly watching passively or uh, sitting in the dark in a theater but actually has the ability to to impact uh, the artist's work on stage and their lives as well. In some ways, I think in, in behalf, you really hand a very vulnerable position of giving the audience member the chance of when to end the performance um, uh, in the piece. And, and that is something that really demonstrates a, a, a position of power, which was told after the story that Wukang gave about uh, how sacred dance is passed on from generation in Thailand. So I think um, the fact that these 
these two productions reveal that process um, is is also something where it it is revealing of the individuals, the independent individuals who are the performers, because uh, they they don't just perform the work as as dancers, but they reveal their biographies behind it. I think in behalf in particular, uh, and then of course in in um, in the other production as well, where you can see that these are the actual individuals uh, who are behind the the, the work, um, and when particularly there is a kind of um, romanticism attached to, to a dancer and what is expected from a, a dancer, a dancer from a specific culture, uh, if they are viewed superficially as representative of a Chinese dancer or a Thai dancer or artist, um, this revealing of the process and the human side, of the individual of who they are, is super important in not just the production itself, but in our overall thinking about uh, the role of a performer on stage. So I think um, that that's revealed through the approach and the strategies that they took uh, with creating the production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Beth. Um, I I wonder if I can ask further. Um, from from your you know position working in the institution, how basically how do you consider this? this kind of project as a product and how normally when you are um, presenting this, you know, uh, this, this, you know, in a way somehow I, sorry, in a way somehow I think like maybe cross culture collaboration can be a big issue because everything is crossing to one another in many diverse contexts. But in this, particularly the, the, the dance piece, uh, in the dance, in the framework of dance production that you have mentioned about the diverse of represent representations from the body, from the skin color, from the cultural background, and when all these um, components being staged in a theater, from your point of view, how do you how do you present it at the same time in a modest way, or using that as a tool of challenging the institution itself or the audience? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think uh, in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned your interest in, in the institutional role in uh, cross-collaboration. And Wu Kang also mentioned and touched on money. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, those are actually really valid points because often from um, a very realistic perspective, sometimes the collaborations do come about from 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 the possibility of resource and that much of our funding comes from uh that that are moved by very different logics you know from where 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 we are as working you know with the artist versus why suddenly there is a grant or a fund and that those come from very bureaucratic kind of political motivation sometimes um and then of course we have collaborations where it's very organic and it happens between artists which are the best kinds but speaking from an institutional point of view i think uh, we have to be real, really realistic about uh, the fact that there are these sometimes these motivations either from the institution, the government, or the the funders, um, and then we have to be very responsible with the fact that uh, we we have these uh, resources to be able to make things happen, um, and then the other reality check is where where your audience's motivations, biases, and understanding come from. Because as presenting institutions, uh, we are often the, the ones setting the entire context for how a work is to be, to be understood. So whether it sits within a festival that has a specific contemporary focus, or whether it's framed within a, this is art from XX, this Asian country, mm. uh, some, some of these things become really problematic because they create the frames. And we all know that with uh, the responsibility of programmers and curators and institutions is you begin the, the audience journey into the work way before they come into the auditorium. 
you know so it starts with the the curatorial frame it starts with the text how it's written the tone um and uh what you say what you don't say um and uh all these become i think for me it's really important that we see this as responsibilities and i think attached to that in terms of institutional thinking is um that in that responsibility, there is a need for us to, to really be invested in artistic practice and understanding it first, mm -hmm. so that uh, we don't create collaborations from a kind of uh, uh, lack of really understanding who we are motivating to come together. And uh, for me personally, in my work experience, the best collaborations aren't uh, so much blind dates and not um, we are we are setting it up. Actually, it's really the best ones come from the artist who is given the support first to then do research for a work that uh, we hope has some kind of inter uh, collaboration and intercultural work. Uh, but if if we are to instigate uh, and to do the the setting up of collaborators, I think built into that has to be um, for us as curators and programmers a very clear uh, understanding with the person who is funding us or the institution backing us um, the risk involved in that and and the the because it is it is purely experimentation first and we have to not expect that there will be this instant outcome of success and that uh, we can do it in a smart way, which is as we as we know, we create phases. Yo-Yo, uh, you, you explained first there was the devising, and and actually there were many phases before you arrived at the final project. And I think that's where we have to be responsible to say let's let's just set up coffee first, and then see what happens. And mm -hmm. and the thing is, we have to give it time. We can't say oh, okay, it has to be next year's festival. You know, it has to be so that. Uh, we set up these things and they, they, they have enough breath and time to be able to, to actually allow it to happen. Otherwise, anything that is uh, under pressure and forced will not give the right kind of conditions. And I think conditions is a word we have to underline as institutions because uh, in the end, we, we set up the conditions that allow or don't allow for the best possibility. Um, and that's something that... Uh, um, it needs to be very fragile. And I think I think also it's worth saying now since we're in uh, intercultural discussion with you know um, people watching from the UK and, and from Taiwan that um, a lot of a lot of audiences would experience dance from a very Euro-American centric position. And that is because most of, of, of uh, performances that we have seen in, in, uh, in our institutions, in our art centers, the big ones, the small ones, are dominated from, from that place, from the history. And that is because the, the funding uh, and resources have been most developed there. And I think now we're in a really good moment where we are getting, uh, you know, in places in, in that are a bit more fortunate, like Taiwan, in China, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, uh, Japan, mm, Korea, definitely. I think that I think we're 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 in a even stronger position as institutions to be advocate for for uh, any kind of collaborative conversations to be on our terms as well, and uh, I think that's very important where. Actually, I can I can draw that from Wukang and Pichet's work most because it was about two people coming together, giving as Wukang you've mentioned before space and time for a relationship to actually unfold. And I think as institutions, we can learn from the the artists. I certainly can learn from Bihar uh, as a as an analogy uh, that that uh, if we are talking about Asia and Europe or Asia and America or Asia and, and anywhere else in the West, uh, that, that we can come uh, on the same, same uh, plane together and not, not to have all these biases and hierarchies that although there is a willingness for us to always come on equal terms, of course there is, especially amongst us as practitioners, but behind that we cannot ignore the histories of resources and funding and thinking. And I think that means that uh, anyone who's working from a more Eurocentric or, or um, mm -hmm. that position needs to, to also be responsible not 
to carry with themselves unknowingly the conversations that uh, come back to very reductive and exotic ways um, of framing and uh, assumptions of where the audience comes from. Right, right. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, um, it's very much reminding um, me at the least, and I think as well as for the online viewers about like the, the you know, like even though from the institutional point of view, formulating or encouraging such cultural projects in, you know, at the time of 2020, like it's, it has been no longer about how we deal with, you know, exotism, such, I think, you know, not, not superficial, but quite fundamental dimension of the creative process. And also in the context of marketing strategy, when you sell or when you introduce this program to your, your local or um, international audiences, but also more importantly, how um, institutions can work with others to together present and in the process of presenting as well as developing and researching that how the institution can be the backup to support the artist to have the, the really deeper and further communication internally at least. And, and I think this is, um, yeah, I, I, I really hope that we will have um, some time to come back to address this um, political issue. But uh, at this moment, I would like to um, uh, look at the project Night Market Theater. And I want to propose a question to Yo-Yo, Donna, and Faith. Uh, Yo-Yo, do you think, or oh, I think you have been imagining before, even with um, Joshua, but have you, uh, Yo-Yo, have you imagined restaging or representing uh, the Night Market Theater again in other parts of Asia? And for Donna, if Yo-Yo wanted and Joshua wanted to bring this project in London or in other parts of UK, how would it work? And for Faith, the same question. If restating the Night Market Theatre project in Helsinki, I don't know if Helsinki has a night market. <laughs> how, how would it work or how would it work in other contexts? Mm -hmm. to ring. Mm. Okay, um, thank you, River. That's a very good question. And that's a question also I sometimes ask myself. <laughs> but uh, first of all, let me uh, add something to the comments you gave to Night Market Theater um, in the previous session. Um, I, I think in terms of social engagement in Taiwan, um, Artists in visual arts discipline uh, already has quite some uh, history of doing this kind of art practice. And so, is, so are people in the theater discipline. But the difference is, I think, the difference between the social engagement before Night Market Theater um, was that um, the method was more um, inclined or oriented to applied theater methods. So for example, like community theater, uh, theater of the oppressed. So that's also, in Taiwan, there's also a lot of people doing this kind of engagement with theater practice. But Night Market Theater, perhaps what makes, what made people so interested in why it caught so many people's attention is that we use some kind of contemporary performance thinking and contemporary methodology to devise and uh, bring, collaborate with theater directors and actors to, to present this kind of hemi <laughs> half theater project in the night market. So yeah, so now back to the question about if I ever thought of touring it in other countries, perhaps in Asia. Um, yes, <laughs> I think most often, uh, well, right before Night Market Theatre finished, we've got some 
uh, inquiries to ask if it's possible to restage it again. And so uh, Joshua and I, we had both, we had some common understanding and agreement that um, we, we, if we want to present Night Market Theater on our own, for example, like we do Night Market Theater again without him or he does Night Market Theater again without us, it's possible, yeah, as long as we tell each other uh, what kind of a context it is. And, but we, I think we, we both, both sides, we have this kind of awareness and willingness is to work again together because it's like a, <laughs> it's like a child, <laughs> a plant we grow together. So we want to keep growing it and make it bigger to see what, what, what it will become in the next version. So, um, yeah, so, so I've been, uh, waiting or paying attention to the possibility of restaging Night Market Theater again with Joshua Sofer, whether in Taiwan or in other parts of the world. But uh, of course, we've talked about if it's going to be in another part of the world, perhaps the first question is, if there is a Night Market Theater culture, no, if there is a Night Market culture in that city, or if there isn't any night market theater, sorry, if there isn't any night market, then what kind of market is there? So we have to really adapt the concept into something that can fit into the local context. Because, but for my part, I think if night market theater is going to be uh, presented again in another culture, then it's still, um, quite necessary that we have a local collaborator because it's the local people that we want to impress. It's the local people that we want to address to. So people who are very familiar with the local things will be the key, yeah, key roles in, um, in the new production. So now, what do you think, Donna? <laughs> You know, I think uh, River must be a mind reader because uh, I did, I was, while I was watching, I was thinking, how could Night Market happen in the UK? Uh, <laughs> uh, because there, there isn't a Night Market culture here. Uh, so I'm wondering, does, because context is so important, uh, the first venue that I thought of, and I will be very venue specific, because I guess I I think about practicalities and details quite a bit. It's perhaps my my journalistic background, curiosity and practicalities. You know, mm -hmm. I, I want to know how many times has Night Market already been performed? Uh, and has it only been performed in one location or have you done it uh, in any other places? Uh, you can answer that in just a bit. Uh, but I was thinking of the South Bank Center. Uh, they have their their uh, when they were open, their uh, programming was very much uh, uh, event and themed and festival based, uh, quite uh, international. And I was thinking, well, if they were to do it, they would probably have to, and and maybe this wouldn't be authentic or real enough. They'd have to recreate a night market which would also include not only food stalls, which they do have some outside as well, but um, incorporate the performance. So it could work in a location like that where there are street vendors. You know, it wouldn't be necessarily considered a night market, but it, it could be adapted for that. Uh, I also, so uh, I wonder uh, with the performers, this is what I'm also curious about. Um, how did you recruit them? Who were those eight performers? What qualities did they need to have? And how well did you know them before the project? Uh -huh. Thank you, Donna. I think, um, well, in terms of the, the location, I remember I visited um, London a few times. So I remember there were quite a several very lovely farmers market 
And I think if we're going to stage night market theater in London, perhaps it's going to be farmer's market theater or flower market theater or fisherman's market theater, that kind of a new production. So yeah, I think South Bank could, could be a really interesting um, scenario to have their usual street vendors. So mingling with our performers. And uh, in terms of performers, that, that's a very good question. And I always remember the first quality that we, me and Yuan, my producer friend, we discussed what kind of performers we would like to invite to this project. And the first thing that came to my mind was uh, he or she definitely has to be bold. I mean, to be courageous, to be very um, not ashamed of losing faith in public. What I mean is that we're going to do something that we ne never tried before. And we, we really didn't have an idea what could come on the premiere night. So we need to have those very strong <laughs> performers who weren't uh, being defeated even if the audience member didn't respond very well. And so among the eight performers, uh, I before we started the rehearsal, I personally knew four of them. And uh, actually, uh, two of them participated in the workshop that Joshua came to Taiwan to give for the first time. So I think that would be, and they they really uh, like the workshop and what they did, their little exercise in the workshop, also uh, very impressive. They, they, they went to the street, talked to strangers and uh, speak, giving a small speech in one train of the metro <laughs> and uh, bowing in front of all the passengers in the metro and that kind of little exercise. And that was very impressive. And the other, uh, the other guy, that's Yuan Xiang, one of the male performers, he blindfolded his eye in a supermarket and do the shopping. <laughs> that was the small exercise in the workshop. So yeah, so Yuan and I, we thought they, should be the very appropriate and right persons to invite it to the project. And then um, because we are not doing it in Taipei, the city we are familiar with, we are doing it in East, uh, in Hualien, the East city, where Yuan, the co-producer, is teaching in university. So we decided among the eight performers, uh, four of them will be coming from Taipei and the other four will be coming from that city, Hualien. So she uh, she has some friend and she knew some of them. So we discussed the, each uh, candidate's personality and their expertise. And then finally we formed this ensemble of, of eight performers. You know, I, I also want to say that I, I didn't mean to be London centric because there are there are the street activities. I wanted to just wanted to say that um, there are other locations in the UK where this could happen. Um, what about um, the 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 people who worked in the night market? Um, how did you need to you, know, you? I assume you needed to say, hey, we're going to be doing this on these dates. Uh, how much how much interactivity or, or uh, interaction before the performances happened was there with them to to have them be informed or even somehow involved or supportive? Mm. Yeah, we started it a couple of months ago um, because we need to find a location in that my nine market. So we started asking around the vendors and also. Uh, some friends who have acquaintances selling food in, in that night market. So we started by asking, hey, have you heard that um, there could be a vacancy 
in one of the booths during uh, October, which period. And then we, in, they asked us what we want. So we told them we want to do, we want to sell performances in that per, uh, particular week. So like little by little, gradually, like uh, spreading the news by words through acquaintances. And so, in, so finally we, went into one vendor who was selling seafood there. He told us he knew the boss of the, the, the space keeper. He has two spaces, but he was too busy. He, he, he was, his business was just too popular. He couldn't handle it with two spaces. So one space is going to be available for us. So yeah, so we approached him and he, he uh, was a very nice and uh, agreed to rent the space to us with a very low price. <laughs> and then we, before we really bring everybody into the night market, we also, oh, and also because we want to do some kind of promotional uh, photography in the night market. And one of the beef noodle uh, shopkeeper was a friend of our, one of our eight performers. So he also very generously uh, providing his little shop, uh, actually a booth for us to do the pho photography. So with that kind of um, things, so I think the vendors in that night markets, they all know that soon there will be a bunch of strange people coming <laughs> into this night market and selling strange stuff. And so during that one week, and because we really attracted a huge crowd, so I think everybody working in the night market know about us. And also people coming into the night market will ask, hey, do you know where the night market is? So uh, during that, we, uh, we also went into uh, different booths whom we have already become friends, asking if you have some, like 10 minutes, you can come over and you can experience our performance, I will put you uh, as the first one in the long check. <laughs> so we did manage to get two or three of them to come and try the performance. And, and how long was that performance booth or stall? How long was it? How long did the performance last typically? Um, we actually, we were there for only like one week every night and every night it was about three hours and and obviously the the response seems to have been pretty immediate if you said you were attracting large crowds yes Is that yes yeah, yeah. Good. Good. um faith um i i really liked before when you talked about responsibility and uh um you know, I'm thinking too. You've you've made me rethink my equation, my geometric, simple geometric thing. I used to think that the reason I kept going as an arts journalist for four decades plus is I was interested in the needs and desires of professional watchers. This is my triangular system: professional watchers, the audience, and artists. But now I'm thinking maybe it's more of a square because the programmers, presenters, you know, what do they need or want or desire? Because I think we all want and need and desire things from each other. And it's those continual relationship building um, motives that have kept me involved for so long as, as an arts professional. So thank you for that, for that making me rethink. Um, but I think it's also perhaps your chance to respond from um, from your perspective and from a Finnish perspective to the night market idea. <laughs> well, okay, I'm new to Finland. Uh, it's been a little bit more than half a year, so it's be it may be tough to to be so precise in the local context. But um, I think uh, the project is really exciting. And when I first saw it on video, I was like, oh, wow, you know, um, the way that it involves um, uh, the possibility of the audience choosing what they can, ex uh, they can experience in a very immersive way, because they essentially do a transaction of paying for 
a, a, a short piece of theatre to be performed with them at the centre, you know, and, and with great surprise. Um, but I think from my perspective, I, I look at the work and I think about what are the, the important components that are integral to its to its structure and frame and meaning. And I see that it it is also, and I don't know if intended or not, but because you put it in a market, and it is called night market, uh, a commentary on um, exchange and value. Because in, 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 in a market, people are buying things and there is a transactional kind of uh, experience and logic that we or understand of a market. And once you put art in that space, it is also uh, emphasizing that the audience plays a certain part in the economy, in the economics of, of art as well. Um, so I, I find that if you read it from that perspective, it's interesting. And therefore, uh, if I was thinking about it in any other context, it would, as you guys have pointed out, have to exist within a place where things are, are bought and sold. Um, so, I, and I think that uh, in terms of the actual content itself of the, of the stories, uh, the, the pieces that are performed within it, um, I guess my question to Yo-Yo would be, would you make them very local? Because in the version that you did in Taiwan, um, many of the references and why the audience or, or the participants were able to, to, ident to relate to it so well is because it was very localized references. Um, and uh, it, in, in Taiwanese culture, but also in Chinese culture. So when I think about the work in Singapore, I can actually see it very easily being performed there um, for, for, the, for those who are Chinese speaking, Mandarin speaking, um, because they would get the, the humor very quickly. And, and I think they would be very, very engaged. Um, when I think about it being performed in, in outside of uh, Asia, or, or rather Chinese speaking um, uh, communities, then I, I also think about, if I'm thinking from the Helsinki perspective, would it not be very nice for actually the Mandarin speaking community here to have a work that they would understand? Because there's not so much work for them, actually. Not so much contemporary theatre, everything here is more Finnish speaking or Swedish speaking. So could it not be a project where you would have a version um, that would be for specifically for the, the Chinese speaking uh, uh, um, people who are living in the country, as well as another version that would be for, for the non-Mandarin uh, speaking. Yeah. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> you sure. heard it here yeah. first, folks. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, I think if we are going to do it, for example, like in Finland, um, we need to maybe have a new composition of the performers. So maybe some from Taiwan and some from the, yeah, the local theater scene. So, but I, I think it would be extremely interesting to make this, um, make this mix happening. So some kind of, um, some kind of humor perhaps that is beyond language. I mean, without language barrier, but something that needs to be, um, only perceived or understood by the people who speak the local languages. And uh, I can share something interesting here um, that's uh, about um, one interaction between Joshua Sofair and one of the performers. So because Joshua, he doesn't speak Chinese. So actually, he, there was one time he said, uh, during our internal meetings, he said to the performers that actually I feel sometimes a little bit frustrated, not really understanding what you guys are talking about. Even though they are being translated, uh, definitely there will be some kind of gap in lost, something lost in translation. And I, he, he, he said something like, I couldn't really um, tell the very trivial difference the, the nuance between each of your uh, presentation. And after he said that, uh, An Yuan, he was one of the performers, replied saying something like, 
but you know, Joshua, actually, I really appreciate the fact that you don't speak Chinese. And for my past professional career, I've been examining and uh, reviewed by all the theater directors about how I presented my lines on stage and how I should speak the, the languages in this way or that way. But the fact that you don't listen the way I speak, uh, you don't listen my language, but you put more focuses on my uh, interaction with the audience member and help me to, to um, help me to find something that perhaps I myself have ignored for a long time. And the feedback Joshua gave to An Yuan was always on how, how to make him feel more, um, he was a very competent actor performer, but he um, is less um, used to participatory approach. So we always told An Yuan that Actually, he's doing a great job. So he just feeling relaxed and being himself, uh, working, trying to have the audience member in front of him to cooperate with him was already the best, uh, best method that he can do in night market theater. So, so when River asks me if there is any kind of cultural translation happening in night market theater, and I was thinking like, no, we did a lot of translation, but nothing like cultural translation. And actually Joshua, he devised this friendly structure that is very flexible for to accommodate different kinds of, um, different kinds of culture or different kinds of, um, customs that was brought by each of the performer. So I, know, I think that really works very well. I'm, I'm thinking, listening to you, I'm thinking about how, uh, for me, uh, another thing that's kept me going as a watcher, an experiencer, a consumer of culture is, is to be a witness with others so that, you know, imaginatively, if I were at night market, I would be observing very closely the interaction between each buyer, you know, I, I, I'm very curious. I, I, I would probably buy tragedy because I just was curious <laughs> what was tragedy, but I would be watching what the others are doing. And there's so much learning to be gained from that, uh, uh, that role as, as the watcher, the observer. Uh, there has been a, a, several questions rolling in uh, throughout the past hour from people. And one of them uh, is from our uh, Taiwan Seasons UK producer, Ji Wenye. Um, she was wondering, Yo-Yo, about um, the difference between site, is there a difference between site-specific uh, performance and community engagement? Uh, you know, could you address that, please? Okay, let me read through this question. Um, okay, the difference between site-specific production and community engagement, from my point of view. Mm. Um, yeah, I think these two terms can differ a lot and can stand alone without the other one. <laughs> so um, that is to say a site-specific production is not necessarily a community engagement product, a project. <laughs> Yeah, also a product. But um, I think in terms of night market theater, it, 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 it is both, it contains both. And uh, so actually regarding the quite several uh, productions of Prototype Paradise other than night market theater, we, I, I call them like context specific productions. So not only site-specific production, but only like social, cultural, context-specific productions. And perhaps, um, yeah, perhaps it, it really needs to take uh, some time before the artist goes into the devising period, before the artist goes into the official creative period. And that was the research period um, 
you guys just mentioned, making researches, and learn about the the local community, and try to integrate themselves into the local community, and that will help a lot to to devise a com community engagement project pro project. But that's also site specific. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I think we are entering the 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 section of the open Q and A with the online viewers. So if you uh, if you have any comments or questions, um, you can simply leave words at the how can I say that the chat room on the YouTube channel. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we have been talking about this scenario of confronting the different cultural backgrounds and the, the context of the society in terms of presenting this night market project, accommodating the night market project or flower farmer's market something. In this, something is bought and sold, as um, they um, mentioned. I, I have another question also in relation to this notion of touring that because behave this dance project has been touring after Taiwan, to, has toured to um, Brussels, Paris, and Porto. Did I miss any other cities? Or only three cities in Europe? Singapore, 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 Singapore. Singapore, Singapore. Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, could you, uh, Ukan, could you, because I, I do believe that uh, you have, you, you and uh, Pichie have been discussing, or oh, each time when you perform this work in different city, with different contexts and of viewers, in the, the the presentation of the, the the institutions. How did you, what what have you received, or how did you receive and feel um, those audience feedback or comments towards this local context between the Thai and the Taiwanese and beyond? Oh, uh, well, uh, includes Europe? When we go to Europe, when we went to Europe, um, I think they, they want, uh, the audience want to be, behave political correctly. So they try not to guess, even though most of them don't know the difference between Taiwan and Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very interesting. And also, in, I remember in Paris, the, one of the audience, I assume she is Chinese. And she says, during the Q&A session, Q &A session, she said, she really enjoyed the Asian vibe and which we found just interesting. I, I, we, we, because we don't know what's Asian vibe. <laughs> like if we move slowly, that means we Asian or if we act quickly, that makes us Asian. So it's yeah, all, all these differences. And also the audience response doing the how how the performance end is very different you can uh most dramatic one is i think it's in singapore because the audience want to push the one who can make the decision to finish the performance and the process is really quite violent so the, the 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 one I choose has the the board. She can decide when to finish the performance by standing up, and uh, like five minutes into that part, at, uh, there was a moment me and Peach stop dancing and we're posing on stage, and the music stops, and one of the audience members starts shouting at her to to say please. Stop the show, stand up already. They're not pigs, they're not animals. And uh, the rest of the audience start to clap, try to push. 
try to push her to finish the performance. So at the end, she she stand up, she stood up, and when the fin the performance is really finished, and the all, uh, most of the audience left the theater, and she stayed there, sit by herself for another fifteen minutes. She was so angry. Yeah. So that. Well, uh, I I would love to know because I, I I don't have as clear, uh, relatively clear, an understanding of how behalf worked. Uh, was it so it was in a, a more conventional theater space? Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it lasted about how long? How long was the perform? Well, uh, maybe that changed every time. Yeah, it changed every time. So it has three parts. the The first part is me and me and Pichet take turn to dance and we share time and space equally. Three minutes by him, three minutes by me, da 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 da. After and we do we had that for five rounds. And usually during that part, some some audience start to get angry because there was no music, I think. Maybe that's the main reason. And then then we, we have another uh, QA. So after the fight time, we take turns and we get up and we took bow and we say we would like to have a Q&A. &A. And so some of, some of the audience think, oh, it's finished. And they start asking real, some of the audience start to get angry. So they ask real question. And, but the question are very different. Like in Europe, they will ask, do you consider yourself doing contemporary dance and why? And, and what's the, why do we need this? And uh, so, um, what's the use of your dance into the society? This kind of question. And after that, I, we start to dance and we bow again and we dance again. And then I hang out a card to one audience member. So I choose one. I took my time to find the right person to give the card to. And she or he will decide when to finish the performance by standing up. And we and then and after I hand out the card, I continue. We continue to dance, and the musician come back. And sometimes that part can last for forty minutes, and sometimes three minutes. Sometimes, yeah, not even start to dance yet. It's finished. And how? What determined the person? that you chose each time? Was it just an instinct for somebody? Uh... I usually choose a, a, look, a friendlier looking person <laughs> that wouldn't torture me. And what, yeah, would, what, would, what would torture involve? Uh, was it a torture to have it last for 40 minutes, that section? Or were you absolutely fine with that? you as a performer we're fine with that okay and, and earlier just, yeah when, when when you said that the audience in singapore was angry was that did they vocalize that anger their impatience frustration how how did that well, manifest we, 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 can, uh, we can hear it like uh, in the first part they start to uh, uh, or they they fidgeting a lot well, and that whole uh, idea of having a kind of middle of the show Q and A, um, I, I think that's an interesting thing to do because it it opens the door. It acknowledges yeah. that and that live collaboration. Yes, and that's the reason why. Oh, we we move it because we also want to know what they think, so we can uh, continue according to the answer. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what is the capacity for the performance? How many audience members typically? Uh, uh, 300, 400. Okay. River, over to you. If you have, oh, wait, you're still on mute. You know, there there are uh, there are other questions actually. Can can I take that back, River? Because <laughs> sure, uh, sure, I know that um, uh, our friend Gary Platt uh, in Scotland he said that uh, he mentioned travel broadening the mind. Uh, it's a sort of uh, stock phrase. 
does collaboration broaden the mind of artists and does it broaden the minds of audiences? What, what do you think about that from a sort of practical and uh, uh, philosophical point of view, anybody? Do audience, artists and audiences emerge with a wider and deeper appreciation? How wide and deep is your appreciation? Go for it, Wukong, if you have an answer. Okay, I'll do a quick one. Uh, I think it does. I uh, We travel back and forth, so I understand more and more. And all the all the previous questions were answered. I was able to uh, make peace with myself. And that's quite difficult because uh, the lack of understanding of my my history, my person, uh, and my family's history, and the island's history, and also before this project, our my understanding of the world is is just missing a big chunk, like the all Southeast Asian part was missing. So this start uh, this collaboration opens up my viewpoint, how I see the world. It's sort of getting a little complete. So yeah, it's definitely broadened my view. And what do you think it does for audiences? Does it broaden their views sometimes? I think I've, I've, art, it, does art it, open minds? I guess that's what I'm asking an artist. Does is is art there and does it effectively open the mind of, of audiences? Do you know? I through uh, um, oh, after this project, there are uh, there's a, a few lines I heard often. Once you seen behalf, you will be. No, it doesn't translate. Uh, so every time audience see a post talk, they get afraid. Oh, your post talk. Your performance traumatized them. Yeah, traumatize all the post talk in Taiwan. So once the post talk starts, some audience start to uh, is this real or is this a stage post talk? <laughs> even for myself, even for myself, because it opens up possibility, and you you don't have to you don't have to uh, pour, uh, perform according to the other uh, tradition. This kind of yeah. it definitely yeah. Yeah. you've you've yeah, said a, a, I, I think I want to... go ahead Faith. Oh. Yeah, just add on to this question about uh, whether it deepens appreciation um, I think I, I, I would expand that to consider that um, when audiences who are not familiar with a specific culture uh, are looking at it for the you know for a time uh it it, it should be sustainable it, it, it cannot be one encounter you know um to to understand if they wish to understand something it's it's similar to the idea that you would go somewhere on holiday and uh you would understand the city or country just because you were there for two weeks or one week it's it's not the case you know and with uh looking at art from asia when it's outside of the asian context i think the coming back to responsibility is that um for funders and presenters that it's not one off because the problem now that we are facing is that often if asian artists get the opportunities to travel to to be presented it's very uh sporadic and there's no sustainability in being able to understand uh, uh, any particular culture or any particular country or any particular practice if you only get to see them once, you know, every, I don't know, four years, you know. Um, so it, it has to be a long-term thinking that if we want to look at, uh, so for example, Wukang or Pichet's work, that we, we be able to see them regularly enough so that we can see their progression and growth and then maybe that's a meaningful uh, way of looking at at uh, culture, but uh, maybe, but even then, it has to be a fuller investment than one off. For me, I feel. 
really and, and there's something in our hands practitioners you know because we decide these these terms you know we we have to to shape these uh possibilities so yeah i guess my 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 big pitch is that uh anyone who's in a position to be able to invite asian artists to, whether it's residencies or projects that we really think beyond just the one-off experience and think with sustainability in mind you know for a long term yeah and is that something you plan to be doing then um at Dance House in, in Helsinki, is is that that uh, more than a one-off? Uh, I'm guessing that is part of your your plan for 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 uh, your your role there. Yes, Faye. Um, well, for now, we're dealing with even more fundamental issues of getting the house built. <laughs> it's currently a construction site project, um, and there are very local. Uh, considerations on on the Finnish dance scene that need to be met first, actually. So that's the place we're at with a new with a new house. Um, but certainly, I think the thinking um, that you know, if it was to show work outside of uh, Finland, uh, should be thought about in in these kinds of terms, long longer terms, sustainability, bringing back you know specific artists uh, reoccurringly, so that one really begins to 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 journey with them and not just a, a short encounter. Um, I, I started to say, uh, uh, Wukang, when you mentioned tradition, um, that made me think of, uh, for some reason, it made me think of also the idea of cultural appropriation um, and, and how is that, I guess that's something to be avoided. I don't know. I'll, I'll give you an example though of, of an experience I had in uh, in America, in South Dakota, I went to a Native American powwow that was held outdoors. I had never been to one before. I was writing a travel article and it was so powerful with the heat of, of the sun and the dancing uh, that people were doing in a circular space wearing um, uh, the costuming that, that the participants had made it featured bottle caps that they had adorned their clothing with. And there was this drumming and vocalizing. It was absolutely overpowering. I had such a desire to get up and move as well. It's one of the most visceral uh, feelings ever that I've had in, in some sort of cultural context. I didn't do that. I, I kept myself in check, but I mentioned it later to, I don't know, one of the drummers or somebody, and he was so great. He said, oh, it would have been fine if you did that. Um, I guess the reason I didn't do it because I didn't want to appear foolish or I don't know, maybe I was worried, self-conscious about being wrong or appropriating something that wasn't mine. But it was so powerful for that time, it was mine and I will never forget it. I absorbed that. So somehow that relates for me to tradition that if I can ingest it somehow, um, that's where the meaning comes for me. And I, I share this with you, not because I don't have a, a specific question, but I just wanted to open up the idea of, of how we experience the other and how we make the other our own and value it. If that's an area, you know, areas worth pursuing today. So to me, working with him is give me the rights to say whatever I want about Thailand because that's the information he shared. And uh, he has the right to say, we, we have, he has the right to say everything about Taiwan because that's that. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I represent Taiwan on stage. He represents his culture, but not in their own country. So in Taiwan, most of the audience are Taiwanese. They don't think I can speak on behalf of them in Thailand as well. So it's really interesting. But when we travel to Thailand, the audience will think I represent Taiwan. Whatever I said is Taiwanese point of view.
So we, when we work with, with each other, we have this cover that kind of sort of uh, help us to solve this cultural appropriation. Yeah, I, I can also add on talking about behalf because I think um, that's the wonderful thing about contemporary performance is that it, it sets up different possibilities to 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 think about uh, encounters. And I, I felt that um, Wukang and Pichet did a, a really very thoughtful job of thinking about, about the differences, the similarities and come, come uh, on, on the same uh, plane, you know, to each other, aware of very much kind of self-aware that these things do exist, and then address it from that position. So not to not to ignore or to 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 leave them aside, but to bring them into into the performance. And I think they created uh, a, a very um, organic way of looking at not so much the other, but the space in between. And and I think that's that's what's really important in contemporary performance that 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 space that can hold that is between the familiar and the unfamiliar and what is that interaction and that dynamic I think that's the more interesting question than um, perhaps uh, the holding on to to what we already know so what is that space in between how how can we begin to understand understand um, that. And and what emerges from there uh, is 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 that culture, and that's that's interesting for me. Anybody else have anything to add to that at the moment? River, you you look like you're going to say something. I know, yeah, but but. Um... Right now, I was struggling which which point can be my entrance <laughs> at this moment. But um, I mean, uh, I wanted to come back to um, the previous question where um, that uh, viewer was wondering how this uh, cross culture collaboration Dutch projects would would broaden the audience. So, uh, the landscape of the view or the, the scope of viewing, I, well, from my point of view, I think it really depends on what do you expect and what, and how do you imagine and understanding cultures themselves. It, it's really, but because for example, um, when I'm seeing or participating in such um, projects, like conflicting different cultural or social or political context, no matter it's like international collaborative setting or not. Um, something, something really fascinating for me is how I can see the findings and the research process of the artists. And such process of debating or speculating or um, you know, negotiating is most exciting um, point of view for me when I watch or view or being part of this kind of project. So, yeah, I guess it's re it really depends on what you expect and what, what, what you want from watching or viewing, participating in such artworks. Well, sometimes I know that as a as a you know professional watcher, as a person, I want to be completely thrown for a loop, and I want the unexpected. You alluded to that faith. I, I want the thing I don't know, but then you know maybe that's just because I bring, I trust an open mind to whatever I'm seeing, even if I have you know a bad experience. I'm open to the bad experience. Uh, uh, there has been a question uh, addressed to you, Faith, um, from uh, our friend Anna at, at Theatre Encore Collective. Um, it's about touring. Uh, is touring in need of transformation? Can we say that that the challenges in during the challenges we're facing now is that is 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 that sustainable? Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, this conversation goes beyond uh, uh, this specific conversation about culture or, or, or cross culture, um, because the the whole uh, ecological challenges and times that we are facing now uh, are also at the forefront of uh, what is the the most sustainable way to continue to do something that that can uh, have quite a big impact, you know, on the environment with the flights and everything else that that touring brings. Um, the this links to a bigger issue about how the whole world has been living, isn't it? Because we we live such fast paced, quick, instant, you know. So it's bump in. Uh, you know, rehearsal performance all in two days and then, you know, perform the show if you're doing a, a specific tour. Um, and then you may have to quickly just get on a plane and go to, to another country and do exactly the same. Um, and how meaningful is it really for the artists and the audience and the programmers who are part of the system? Because we are just trying to, to get things going and we don't have necessarily the time to have meaningful conversations. Um, so, so in a in an ideal world, I think we would slow this process down, and I think we would give um, value to meaningful interactions, uh, so that the audience can become acquainted with what they are going to experience before they do so, or uh, if if preferred after. You know, sometimes there's a preference if you if you want to learn more before, or if you see it first and then you go through some kind of uh, um, dialogue with the artists or the curators directly, the programmers. Um, and also uh, what kinds of possibilities can it be so that that it's not again one-off, but there is some kind of network. And I think um, performing art networks are very, it's, it's at the front of our minds about how sustainable moving artists and productions can be. Uh, in other words, there's no real, you know, answer yet. We're all we're all trying to figure this out. But I advocate that we do, and I advocate that we we think about how we what we actually value in the process of touring. What what is what is the the most important thing um, in in us supporting a tour, uh, and how can we even with with uh, very constrained resources uh, uh, respond from that value. Not just okay. We want to bring this artist and quickly perform, and and yay, you know, we we program that artist, and that's great. But but what else can we do that is really of value, and how can we make it happen? And slowly, perhaps we'll we'll find new models of of uh, touring. And the arts is very very much a process of of uh, change. You know, if we think about it, in the last twenty years, how how have has uh, uh, everything impacted the way we move, the way we think, the possibility? So much has changed, you know, in terms of of movement. So I I I have I do not doubt that we will find more more possibilities uh, to make things more sustainable. And in the first uh, webinars that happened in this uh, month long symposium, which audience, by the way, th those are available. They've been archived at cultural Taiwan UK and Taiwan season uh, on the YouTube uh, of both cultural Taiwan UK and Taiwan season YouTube. In those uh, first week sessions, which were looking at venues uh, and and international collaborations, um, the two, two ideas that were brought up were uh, a greater focus in a pandemic, pandemicized world on local um, interaction, cultivation of culture, et cetera, et cetera, and also longer term, or perhaps from, from your point of view, Faith, um, return longer term relationship building. Um, so I, I, that is probably, yes, the way the world is working for any, any number of reasons. And let me just see if there are other uh, questions that we haven't uh, addressed. There was an earlier one about um, the use of the word translation, which uh, implies linguistics as opposed to experiential. You know, I, I know this is semantics, but I have a question for all of you, which is uh, buzzwords, uh, multidisciplinary, 
transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, are they all valid in to describe uh, the kinds of work that are done today uh, or presented or programmed? W w are they interchangeable? Is that language in interchangeable? So there's that about something disciplinary, but also about the use of the word translation. Um, per perhaps I can, well, because I, I can't see this title, right? So um, when I use translation, I'm not using translation as a singular existence. I use co cultural or cross-cultural translation as the terminology. However, this terminology comes together with collaboration. So basically, um, I don't see the word translation existing itself in this context. Because what I was interested or what I have been interested about course culture or, or culture or course social, whatever translation is really about how, you know, two or more than two bodies encounter. And when they, when those sectors and bodies encounter, they have dialogue. However, how can they, how they, how they can build up this dialogic relationship? Because, uh, because it requires translation. And this is what I mean. And it's, of course, it can be linguistic during the creative process. For example, I do believe that when Wukang and Pichet work together, they are both using um, English instead of their mother tongue, right? And for example, when in the Night Market Theatre's case, uh, the, the UK artist is using his first language where the Taiwanese setters are not. So of course it's linguistic. At the same time, um, I would say it's also social and political. I mean, when you are when, when, when artists are communicating or getting better understanding to each other's context and eventually come out of creative process, it requires a lot of translation. Maybe we can also say negotiation attached or followed by this process. Well, there's also body language, uh, which, which physicalizes the, the whole word. Um, and this makes me think of that comment you made before, Wukong, about somebody talking about the Asian vibe. How did you, did that get addressed when that was brought up? Um, was there any uh, inquiry on your part about what that uh, person meant by that? Or did, did it, was it just used and was it in the air and then kind of not really addressed? Yeah, it didn't get answered. We all, we, we, we replied by asking, what do you mean? And slow motion means Asian or this kind of question to answer her okay. question. No, but that, that sounds like you did address it. So that's good. Yeah, you know, because, yeah, we, sometimes people think meditation or being a monk or walk slowly belongs to Asian. Yeah, but, but not true. Not well, so. Asia is really fast, isn't it? Isn't it like speed and crazy all the time as well? The, 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 the you know, the, the extremes. Mm. Now I'm just going to trawl through. Ah, well, so um, is there more to be said about about uh, creation, uh, cross cultural translation, etc., in a time of COVID, or have we have we kind of dealt with that? Do you think, folks on the panel, anything more to be said about the conditions where we we exist with now? Do you mean particularly in a pandemic context? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> mm. Anyone else? Yes, Yo-Yo, go ahead. 
I've been working with Joshua on another new project that's uh, that's planned to be presented in Taiwan in January. But we've also been yeah. So we also plan that he came to he comes to Taiwan at the end of this year and works also like a month or two, and then we present we stage the new production. But we also talk about the possibility uh, that perhaps he cannot make it to fly over here to Taiwan. So yeah, what what I think just like the rest of the the world, the artists have been trying to. To, to work with the flow, with their own intuitive, how to cope with the, the pandemic, but at the same time, stay in dialogue with each other, remain this, this uh, idea interchange or any, kind, any kinds of, any formats of interaction with people in another corner of the world. And, Right, but I, I, and I think that's still um, can broaden our mind. That still means a lot, especially during these very uh, shaky and unstable times to stay in contact with one another. Hmm. We have time for, for some, um, any more uh, urgent last minute questions or if there's anything we haven't covered it might be good to uh you know repeat um uh your questions so that we can uh, we we can address it oh who was that special guest wukong by the way that was my daughter okay. and her <laughs> name is ganesha and she's obviously going to be a performance artist at some point a live art maker or something He's already. <laughs> has has having a, a child in your life? Uh, how has it altered the kind of work you make? Oh, it just make my work more interesting because you don't have. I don't have time to to pondering about things. So you need to make decision, and uh, when she arrives, we start to make decision one after another and you don't have the look luxury to slow down so so it's really nice i i have a question about taiwan because i was so impressed based on that first uh webinar session with the resources that are available and one of the reasons this symposium is happening is because uh, again as as a london based person who works with and on behalf behalf of uh, Taiwan season. I do love the word behalf. It's such a nice word. I'm, I'm glad you chose it as a title. Um, I have the impression that Taiwan has is, is kind of opening its arms and saying, uh, look, we're here. We have these resources. Uh, please be interested in us. And we will be reciprocally interested in you. Um, is, is is that an accurate impression that I have of 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 uh, you know if if you could if you could dare to speak on behalf of Taiwanese culture anyone is is this is this a <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing but uh, yes spokespeople for Taiwanese culture um, but is that is there that feeling uh, amongst any of you or within any of you that that this is a a, a very vibrant vital uh, rich Sort of, I'll do that again. Rich sort of place, right Wait. now, culturally. I will pass the microphone to Yo Yo and Wukong because they have been experiencing this parallel universe of Taiwan lately. Hmm. Well, my understanding is, uh, our, my country, our country does not have uh, politically don't have really friends. So this is our time to, to to share, to bond, make the bond, and we have a so kind of enemy. So we, yeah. So this is a good time for us to play our role and uh, 
because I think we are one of, one of the uh, first countries to move to uh, imaginative post-pandemic period. So we move really fast. Uh, I myself participate or plan to do the online project and get called off because of the pandemic was slowing down and and also the online project so three three of those already so it's, uh, our government is really moving really fast especially the culture department okay uh, we've had a question about if you could collaborate with any artist in any country who would it be and where oh it doesn't uh, we would they, um, on the government side on the supporting side they don't really specific uh, they they didn't say which direction you can do all sorts, and they encourage continue uh, collaboration internationally. And and by the way, Yo Yo, you could answer that earlier question I had about you know as a spokesperson for Taiwan. Um, <laughs> well, I think my idea is quite similar to Wu Kang's, and uh, yeah, Taiwan, Taiwan has. I have to say Taiwan is a country with a great resilience. That is to say, we really don't have much diplomatic space on international platform, on the international stage, political, po po politics wise, but um, on economic and cultural wise, what we, what we try to do is to to show to the other partners of the world that we are a citizen of the world, that we can do our best and to contribute to, to making the world a better place from our own perspective. And I think that's why this Taiwan culture season, uh, that's why this Taiwan culture season wants to address, wants to focus on. So, um, and yeah, so by, by showing to uh, the other people of the world the, the, the quality of resilience of Taiwan, we hope, I think <laughs> we can kind of demonstrate some kind of um, people's power to, to yeah, to find a place in the contemporary society in the in the world, and hopefully that can be a uh, some kind of example or inspiration for the people in the other parts of the world. Um, Theresa May, when she was prime minister here, uh, I, one of the things I most disliked that she said was a statement about. If you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. And, uh, you know, I'm ready to be a citizen of nowhere, which is, you know, flip it around, you're a citizen of everywhere. And I think- I know you are ready. <laughs> well, one of the reasons for doing this is because um, it, it's about increasing understanding. Uh, you know, that's what you're saying, Faith, about that in-between place. It's, it's all about, uh, uh, understanding and um there was a comment too you know what is the importance or value of a painting to society uh which is a very good basic why does art exist but i i, I guess for me it's about about greater understanding so in that spirit i think we should wrap up um any pearls of wisdom from anybody you, you each have uh 20, 30 seconds to say something, if you if you like, if you have any any final statement. Faith, shall we start with you? Anything you want, any goodbye you'd like to make? <laughs> um, well, I need to think about this, but I, I guess given this, this platform, uh, I think that 
Uh, yeah, I, 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 there are so many issues right now that we're all, we're all going through uh, with regards to resources and funding for the arts. I mean, many places, uh, I mean, particularly in London, as I've been hearing, really trying times. And um, I, think, I think the realities that we're all facing are very unique given different spaces. But, but I do believe that, um, that as, as, as what was said just now, there's a resilient to, resilience to all of us working, working in the arts. And I think um, we need to be able to support each other. So if there are people listening who have that potential resources to really, really uh, channel them to places where, where we need them most, um, which is keeping things things alive and afloat. Um, and I think um, that if there's any possibilities to, to channel grants for artists uh, to continue to do research practice, even if they're stuck in their countries, uh, I, I think now is a good time to, to be able to advocate for that. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yo-Yo, any final well, word? Well, just like, let's stay in conversation with each other and um, yeah, and don't be afraid of failure. <laughs> Let's keep experimenting. Thank you. Wu Kang? Xie Xie. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm very grateful to COVID-19. <laughs> that brings us together and brings a uh, human race together that we experience the same thing, uh, regardless of colors and and, and, and country, so very grateful, and we should survive. And, and River, um, any pearls of wisdom at the end? And do you want to give a plug for Friday's Friday's oh, webinar? Yeah. So yes, for this um, UK Taiwan Connection Online Symposium, I have conceived this one about cross culture practice, and the other one will be on Friday. Uh, that will be about live art and performance exhibition in Taiwan. Okay. And anything else you want to add before we say goodbye to our, our lovely audience in each of you? want to say thank you. <laughs> yeah, particularly, I wanted to thank um, Faith because we, yeah, because I, I knew that um, lately Faith moved to Helsinki to work for this new position. However, I didn't have um, the opportunity yet visiting her from Paris to have uh, to Helsinki and already locked down. So, and then, yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah, take care, stay healthy. And yeah, because I'm, I'm currently back to Taiwan, but uh, hopefully uh, the situation in France and Europe will get better. And then when I come back to France, uh, in November, I, I hope the whole situation will be yeah, in another on another page. Mm -hmm. So stay also, tuned. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Stay tuned for further developments and stay stay safe and healthy, audience. Uh, come back on Friday if you can. Next week, uh, just as a little plug, we're dealing with the webinars will be based on indigenous arts. Uh, I'm doing another uh, interview with the final choreographer on Tuesday from Taigu Tales Dance Theater. And the interview I did uh, about the production Fighters will be rebroadcast on Thursday. Everything will be archived uh, on uh, Cultural Taiwan UK and Taiwan Season. But we do love that there are people live with us interacting. Thank you. I hope we addressed as many of your questions as we could and you've had an interesting time. Go forth, be creative, enjoy yourselves. Shay Shay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, friends.